Three days after returning to her home planet of Dauphine, Dash struggles to wake from 16 hours of the deepest sleep she's had in years. After crying herself to sleep the night before, it's as if her body simply shut down. The emotional weight of returning home to a world she ran from so long ago. The physical soreness from her fight with the Covindian transplants. All mixed with the emotional impact of seeing how things have changed. Not to mention how much of Oscar's foolish earnestness has remained. Learning about and then meeting Sinclair. Finding out about Ada's illness. The weight of everything all at once simply had sent the medic into autopilot. Now... As her eyes shoot open, she turns to see that the holographic clock floating next to her bed reads 12 p.m. Half the day is gone already. Looking around her bunk suite on the roving dawn, Dash realizes what a comfort this place has become for her. What solace, quiet, and peace it's brought her in such a time of self-examination. So, what is Dash thinking about in this moment, and where is she emotionally so far with the journey of everything that she's experienced upon returning to her home up to this point. Uh, She's in a really weird place right now. I mean, coming home has definitely been a roller coaster of the unwillingness to, to, to be back, but also like the pride and how defensive she's become about Dauphine, especially with the Comindians being here. And then as far as like everything going on with her, with her family in the back of her brain, she's missed it. Like, especially the back and forth with her mom and like being with her brother. She's, she's not really impressed with Brody's political views right now. It was Brody, right? Yeah. Cody stayed home. Okay. Yeah. She's not really impressed with, with, with Brody and how he's acting right now. And then just everything going on with, with Ada, she's, emotionally drained but also like it's reinvigorated her that she's got something to do now something to focus on well she's definitely going to focus on figuring out what's going on with Ada Um, she really wants to track down the doctors and question them and you know look at the scans and everything and Ada's Ada's chart from down the ship's central hallway Dash hears a pair of voices that she does not recognize, talking casually. It's pretty loud, and it's muffled, so because the door's closed, and it's like, you know, down the ship, she it's it's very much like the, the Charlie Brown, where it's like, I hear voices, but it's like... Okay, but they don't sound like they're like actually like on the ship. Okay, no, then she's not going to worry about calling Aries. She's just going to quietly exit her room and kind of like peek around the corner. In socked feet, Dash exits her bunk room and steps out onto the cold metal flooring of the ship's central hallway. The weakest of smiles splits her lip when the sensation makes her think of her father. The man had always been most amused by the simplest of pleasures. It's one of the things she had most adored about him. Part of her had been a little upset that he'd been unable to come to the ship along with the rest of the family. But she also understood the importance of a strong work ethic. <clears throat> she couldn't help but wonder what the temperature within the kelp harvesting mechs he'd mentioned being trained on was like since the deep water couldn't be too dissimilar from the vacuum of space. Upon arriving to the galley, it's clear to Dash that the two voices she'd heard weren't live, but instead a broad but instead a broadcast video on the Hexanet. Sitting in one of the table side chairs, Ibiov eats her typical breakfast of watered oats, and Ares thrums happily in the air above her. As Dash enters the room, Ares swivels to face her and produces a tiny digital smiley face before turning back to face the screen. Projected as a holographic image before the pair, two colorfully dressed local Dauphine newscasters sit at an anchor's desk. Floating in the air between the newscasters is another holographic video that's showing clips from the political gala from the other night. Of course, the biggest news of the evening was the arrival of the delegation from the royal family of Navoyu, Odessa. Right you are, Spilio, and their first visit to that since last year's devastating tragedy. Here we're seeing the princess of Odessa, Karina Vasilievich, followed by her brother, Raz Vasilievich. 
What a dress on her. Isn't that gorgeous? Absolutely stunning, Sarka. A member of our producing team was informed that both the dress and the suit are original pieces by Kavindian master tailor Moshan Rawani. I love the high collars. Truly frames their face in a royal light. Indeed, it really does. I'm surprised Mr. Rawani had enough gold to cover the pair when the holographic image between the pair of anchors changes to show the currently ruling your family and their entrance into the banquet. Everyone knows that the colors of Kavinda are green, silver, purple, and black. On the screen, <coughs> Delco Mur Del on the screen, Delco Muir passes into the crowd, followed by the focused Cadmus and the bright, smiling and waving Calypso. Newscaster Marker responds, and what a regal color combination. Suddenly the hexnet news freezes on the image of a smiling Calypso. Azibiov, who's finished with her breakfast, delicately sets the spoon into the bowl and pushes it away from her across the table. Turning to look at Dash, Ibiov says, <clears throat> The princess chose a neckline far too plunging for her age, I say. That girl is too desperate to be perceived older than she is. I don't think she knows what it is to be a child. I don't think these kids ever got to be children. It is quite a shame. All children deserve their youth. So... You are still here. I'd wondered if you'd left during the night. I came up to get food from the galley after your family departed, and well, I heard you crying. I, I would have checked on you, but it is rude to pry in such times as that. Dash kind of looks away from her, a little bit embarrassed that uh, if y'all have heard her crying, and she says, thanks for respecting my privacy. And she kind of like, takes that in and, and doesn't really say anything and Dash is kind of standing there and, and both of the women are silent for a moment and Ibiov kind of like impatiently taps her fingers on the table before being like, so she is sick then the old woman yeah it ain't something I've ever seen before though, it's real weird the hexagalaxies I fear get weirder, weirder and weirder as time goes on Hey, Ibiav, you by chance know anything about parasites? No, I'm sorry. Ibiav does not know anything about organic beings. Uh, you give me a wrench and some electronic tools and I can make magic, but... Anything else, I I just don't have interest in it. Well, hell, it's worth a shot. Medic Dash... Tell me, why did you leave this world to begin? Gosh, I don't know. I just... I never felt settled here. Never felt like I belonged. I always knew that there was something bigger out there. And I just felt like I needed to see it. Be a part of that. Would you allow me to make an observation, Medic Dash? Sure. Over the last ten months together on this ship, the two of us have not spent much time together. This has been design. Uh, this has been by design on my part. However, in the small space that we share, I hear things and I see things. And what I see with you is a woman running from a beast that she cannot escape. For nearly a year, you feared the return to a planet that never defined you. Why? Dash is kind of taken aback by this because, yeah, they haven't had much interaction and, like, she's never really taken notice of, of Ibiov. Quiet people hear a lot more than they let on. Well, after I left and got used to not being here and feeling more complete than I've ever felt, not at home. I just kind of regretted coming back, having to face this, having to face my family. There's a lot of guilt here. And what is it you fear that you are, <clears throat> and what is it you fear that, that you will be seen as some sort of failure, that you are not good enough? Nah. 
No, nah, I'm afraid that they're going to find a way to make me stay. I don't know that I can stay on this planet, not after seeing so much and, you know, being being a part of that bigger thing than, than what's here. Well, I will say this. Lord Pavlovich has a knife for talent. Nobody on this ship is anything less than the top of their skill. If you are here, you are capable of whatever trouble stands in your way. You will find what you're looking for. But, Veronica, if I may call you, sus, you must let your exterior worries die. They are not you. It is, it is best not to make attachments. She's going to chew her lip and she's going to be like, oh, thanks for the words of wisdom. Everything on our lives are temporary. This is something I have known my whole life. If there is nothing to be attached to, then there is nothing that can hurt us. Emotionally, at least. If the old woman is sick, you will hear her. Of this I am sure. But... If your aim is to find your true calling, I suggest you broaden your search. Yeah. Bet your ass I'm going to fix that old woman. My question to you is simply this. Will fixing her be enough for you to feel content? If you are anything like me, I think not. And if that is the case, Medic Desh... If an achievement as great as saving a life isn't good enough for you, then you are truly alone. Okay. I think I get what she's saying. She's Russian, so it's that there is a there is a a a, a boundary in you know the way she's speaking. Right. Okay. Well, if y'all, you've definitely given me a lot to think about. And uh, I'll, I'll try and get more of this confidence that you seem to think I have. And at that, Ibiav gets up from the table, puts her biodegradable bowl and spoon into the furnace, gives Dash a shrug, and says, Nobody can do it but you, Medic. And heads down to the stairs towards the engine room. Ares turns to follow after the mechanic, but hesitates at the staircase to turn around and beep a little inspirational tune to Dash as the robot does a little wiggle in the air. Dash smirks for herself. Thanks, Aries. <laughs> He's the emotional support bot. Okay, so then with Ibi I've gone, like what kind of things would she, like how, how would she study? Because she's got the pills and she's got, I would assume, probably a, a vial of her blood. Yeah. With the blood, she's probably going to try and use uh, like a mic- microscope to see if there's any like smaller parasites or anything weird going on with with the blood she's also going to so she did the full body scan mm-hmm. and what kinds of things does that would that tell her she gave this like holographic image of this fucking worm coming out of her heart wrapped around all of her muscles and her skeletal structure and essentially it was reading that like for the most part, she seems to be relatively healthy. It's just that there's this like xenobiological foreign entity inside of her that is eating her. Oh, so would it tell her like hormone levels and like heavy metal levels and things like that? Yes. Okay. So she has all of that information already. So she's going to physically examine the blood to see if there's any, like microparasites that are like spawning off that might grow to be something bigger. Does Dash uh, use any of her own blood as a control? Yes. Okay. So when she tests the worms, cause like she's seeing, it's pretty much the same thing. Whenever she looks into Ada's blood, it's very much that these microscopic worms are essentially just like, asexually self-reproducing. And when Dash puts clean blood in there, what she watches happens 
is essentially that when the worms migrate into the mixed blood, they begin to eat her white blood cells, only to then nearly immediately excrete out another worm. Ew. Yeah. Then, when Dash crushes up one of the pills into a fine powder and puts it into a solvent and studies that through a microscopic version, she sees the same worms in there coming to life and realizes that each single individual grain of powder is filled with seemingly prehistoric fossils of billions and billions of these microscopic worms. Oh my gosh. Okay. What kinds of human safe chemicals does she have in the lab? What do you want? That she You've can got that what... she can test to see if anything kills them. You've got whatever you need. Like fucking vastly like made sure that this place was essentially equal to like a military trauma center. Like okay. whatever Dash needs, she's got. Okay. So first thing she's gonna try is the antiparasitic that she gave Ada. Okay. And how does she do it? She's going to kind of do it the same way. She's going to, um, cause I'm guessing it was in pill form. So she's going to crush it up and, um, mix it up with the solvent to get it to a liquid form. And then she's going to, um, drop a dropper on Ada's blood. It immediately starts to boil. Ooh. <laughs> Fuck. With this, she's, she's kind of panicking. Right now, yeah, because she doesn't out of stress, out of stress, out of stress, out of stress. <laughs> yeah, well, she's definitely gonna call her and tell her not to take the pills. As, as Dash goes to grab the phone, a familiar beeping that signifies the arrival of a short com message alerts her that she's finally gotten a reply from Di <clears throat> from Doctor Feichel's office. Upon opening the note, a holographic image appears of a front desk clerk who is obviously far too young to be Dr. Feichel. The assistant says, Good afternoon, Miss Dashing Star. This is Vernon over at Dr. Feichel's office, just responding to your request from last night for the release of medical files pertaining to one of our patients, a uh, Miss Ada Trolling Rock. I'm sorry to inform you, but that request has been denied. Due to the nature of these clinical trials being overseen by our company's contracts, non-disclosure policies, this message is to inform you that this matter has been closed by our offices. Thank you for the inquiry and have a good day. If you have any further questions, our address is, and then you literally see like the address appear of the building. Like da -da 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 -da. The message ends, leaving Dash to stare at empty space in shock at this news. Uh, she's definitely frustrated by that. Um, she's still going to go forward with calling her family, though, since that's a little bit more important because she doesn't want Ada to start taking these pills. Who does she call? Who would be home with Ada right now? Probably. Is there like a house phone? Yeah, I'd say it's probably Vivian would be the, the closest person to her. Okay. All right. Yeah, she'll call Vivian. And Vi Vivian answers pretty quickly. Like a holographic image of her appears in front of Dash and she can see that the two that Vivian and Ada are actually walking down the street in Far Shore. So they're they're back home. They're they're and Dash can see that Ada seems okay. Like she Hey sweetheart and, and Vivian says are, uh, you, are you coming home? Dash starts breathing again. She didn't realize that she was holding her breath. And she says, oh, thank God she's still up and walking around. Mama, don't let her take those pills. Take them away. I gave them to her last night thinking they would help, but they are not going to help. Do not let her take those pills. And, like, she, Vivian kind of stops, and Ada goes, what did she say? And and Vivian goes, Veronica, what are you talking about? She took one last night and another this morning, just like you told her to. She, now, now we're not supposed to take the pills? What What's going on here? Does she need the other pills? No, she shouldn't take those pills either. Well, then but... what do we do? Is she all right? I still don't know. I just... I saw a really weird reaction with her blood and the pills that I gave her, but... If she took two already, how is she still up and walking around? 
Dear, I'm not the medic. I I don't know. We're yeah, Mama. I'm not. I'm not asking you to to answer that. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Jeez. Okay. Well, uh, sorry. And then like Ada's like, well, so honey, what do we do? Just don't don't take any more for right now until I can get a handle on this. I didn't like what I see. Should I, should I, and, and Veronica's like, should she be resting? Should she be drinking water? Should I be putting a cold washcloth on her head? Dear, you're starting to scare me. Just have her take it easy for now. Don't take any more of the antiparasitic pills. And if she's got any pills from this doctor, whatever, stashed around the house, definitely don't be taking any of those. All, all right. And, and Veronica's like, when when should we expect to hear back from you? I don't know yet, Mama. Just just be available. Uh, all right, dear. And Ada's like, don't worry, sweetheart. It's gonna take a lot. It's it, whatever whatever's gonna bring me down is gonna need the weight of an elephant. Ah, oh, no, Ada. You're one tough gal. Our Vivian just kind of looks in the camera and she goes, "Don't don't hesitate to call, Veronica." Uh, her look kind of softens and. I won't. And it's like, boo-doo. She's definitely really confused about how the antiparasitic interacted with the blood, but Ada's still up and moving around, so maybe that there's there's something going on with, I don't want to say blood-brain barrier, because obviously it's not blood-brain barrier, but, uh, you know, like similar breaking down by gastric juices, maybe, of being in the stomach rather than, you know, going full throttle on the blood. And, I mean, she's definitely frustrated. I'm trying to think if there's any more tests or anything that she wants to do. But a prehistoric parasite. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she doesn't know it's prehistoric. All she knows is that, like, this is, this is like, a fucking powdered worm, like, that is completely fucking dried out. Like, completely dried out. So okay. it's it's clearly, like... And it's like getting reconstituted. It, it, exactly. In the blood. It's like fossilized. Okay. So, I mean, she feels like at a loss of, of what these are. I mean, obviously she'll try and like search databases for parasites, but I'm going to assume that she doesn't come across anything that looks familiar nothing. to this. No, nothing. Or that looks similar to this. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely um, so, not. Yeah, so she's going to set her sights on the doctor. Okay. Do you think that it's honest to Dash's character that she would seek this out by herself? Um, I think the answer is yes, based off of the way that you've played her. But it's your call. I think she would, especially because everybody else is is otherwise occupied. Yeah. I think and, that and the fact that this is personal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like, just, I, I don't even know who she would pick that she would think would be right helpful for it. I, I could see Torn. I could see her leaning on Torn, but she knows he's busy. Like, yeah. So I could see her being like, plus, this is this is just going to talk to a doctor, you know? Like and granted, this is obviously some fucked up shit. I just I, I, I've spent weeks thinking about it. Roz absolutely not. Grizz mm-hmm. really no reason at all to include him in this. Karina, like, knows as far as Dash, nothing about science or medicine. It's like a, a massive weak spot for Karina. And Torn is really just kind of good for backup, really. Yeah. So I was like, I just think she'd do it by herself. Yeah. So. The only reason she would try to use one of the kids, and it would probably be Karina over over Roz, would be just um, the political influence. Right, yeah, to throw her weight around. Yeah. And I think that she probably would have all these thoughts, and I think that she would probably be like, I don't even know if she has any weight to throw around. I, I mean, like, yeah. I thought maybe she would have, but now after fucking seeing Resort to Fina and how much, like, Kavina's got an iron grip on this place. Yeah. The trip from Resort to Fina's core borough of Norlando to the outer borough of Tampa 
only took Dash an hour by way of water taxi. She wasn't sure where Torn, Karina, Roz, or Grizz were, but that was relatively par for the course for her experience of the events of the Royal Tour thus far. Of the eleven planets they'd all visited before arriving to Delphine, Dash had only really spent much time with the kids on two of them. First on Salamnikar with Karina and their surreal education with the Bertalists, and then again on Ashkabak during the Holly Festival when she'd sacrificed a picture of her family that had helped to carry her through many emotional trying years with the Metacore. Passing through the streets of Tampa, Dash is struck at how utterly different this borough is from the others that she's visited in Yorami and Norlando. Tampa, unlike the neon seductive and cultural bubble of Yorami, or the loud, garish, exciting thrill of Norlando, is subdued and relaxed, like a gigantic suburb. The area is still as bright as the other areas of Resort de Fina, and Dash is glad for her shades because the white stucco of the exterior walls to nearly every building reflect the sunlight a bit too sharply. Rows and rows of palm trees, bell flowers, and magnolia bushes line verges in highways and along sidewalks of quieter areas. Office buildings are squat and square, just like their smaller residential buildings. Eventually, Dash's trip comes to an end when her driver pulls the hover jeep to a stop at the sidewalk outside of a massive walled complex that sits within the city center. After paying the driver, she gets out of the vehicle and looks up to see a set of gigantic holographic floating letters above the singular entrance to the com- to a massive complex that reads Covenda Social Outreach Pavilion. The Covendian flag is on a pole atop the Dauphine flag, both waving strong in the wind. Printed on the concrete wall is also the logo of the Covindian military. At the entrance, there's a large security barricade that every car has to stop at to show their identification. Noticing a line of locals leaning up against the wall waiting for their turn to have their identification scanned and allowed entrance through a turnstile, Dash heads over to get in line. The wait lasts another hour before Dash is finally admitted entrance. To no surprise at all, there's no problem with her credentials as a USAW citizen, and she's allowed entrance, passing easily by the squad of armed Covindian soldiers. What holds the process up, however, is when the Covindian soldier running the security booth says, The pavilion is a weapons-free zone, ma'am. Anything dangerous you're carrying is required to be confiscated and detained here or at another of our security outlets. She said, ah, shit. As 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 she's doing this, He's like, your personal items will be cataloged, secured, and returned to you upon your departure from the pavilion. Um, She probably had the electrostatic pistol with her. Okay. So, she... so everything else she probably would have left on the ship because obviously, you know, she's not going to be like rolling around town heavily armed. <laughs> yeah, just double shotguns. All right. Yeah. Within the complex, Dash sees multiple buildings, none of which appear to be any kind of general hospital for the public. While there are medical office buildings within the pavilion, this is not one building. This is like a massive walled complex with multiple buildings inside. Within the com- like there's like you can see you can see open sky above. Within the complex, Dash sees multiple buildings, none of which appear to be any kind of general hospital for the public. While there are medical office buildings within the pavilion, there are also private schools for local children and an elderly community called Sunset Haven. What is most unnerving to her, however, is that though the outer walls are all concrete from the outside, once you get into the pavilion, The walls on the inside are covered in massive screens that project images from around the planet. Beaches, colonies, the ocean. Like some kind of dream. Her culture on display in perfect 4K for everyone to see. For a moment, she even recognizes a shot of far shore, filmed from a distance as the sun sets across the ocean line. She's in awe 
but also like super creeped out. Like it's cool, but it's so weird. Yeah. From a loudspeaker above her head, an unknown woman's voice says, And remember, the Covenda Social Outreach Pavilion is there for all residents of Dauphine, from the long-term generational local family to the bright-eyed new arrival. Everyone is welcome here on these sunny beaches. What is Dash's, what's going through Dash's mind right now? And like she's not alone. I mean, there's there's people walking in behind her through the individual turnstile. There's cars passing through the security gate. She can see that, you know, there's there's old people in their front lawns, you know, like a quarter, not a quarter, but like an eighth of a mile away in this little sunset haven pavilion. And there's schools rushing, or there there's children, you know, getting let out of the schools for the day because it's probably about two three o'clock in the afternoon at this point so it's like a whole city within a city yeah yep 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 but it's walled this is this is weird and it and there's it, a millet and there's the Covindian military logo on the outside of this place so yeah i mean like she's still just caught between that place of of awe and weird um and 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 not a single person that she sees in the not a single person that is walking through the turnstiles, not a single elderly person, and not a single child is a tourist. Every single person inside the pavilion that she sees other than security looks like they came from Duffin. Is she able to like listen in on anybody's conversation? Like, Are there enough people passing by her that she can catch snippets? What's she looking to hear? She's just trying to get a general vibe of the place and um, you know, kind of what people think of it. Okay, yeah. So, essentially, she catches people talking about heading towards a food bank or going to look for, going to speak with a social service agent to try to find a job or, like, talking about how the employment offices were filled up early last time and that's why they are getting here now at 3 p.m. so they can basically set up tents to get out there at six o'clock in the morning to try to get a job dash talks about parents dash hears parents talking to their children about grades that the kids got from preschool uh leading up to or daycare leading up to preschool and you know what go ahead and roll an observation for me okay um she recognizes that the name of the the school is called smiley day pre-k yeah, I don't have anything for observation. Okay. A shock of memory from the day before spills into Dash's mind as her eyes cross over the school as she remembers seeing a piece of paperwork hanging on Kara's fridge with the school heading of Have the Most Smiliest of Days. Yeah. So, is it no, it's too late probably for school to still be in session. She was just thinking maybe she would see Sinclair there. But, like, she's obviously not going to go and try and track her down, right? Because she's only met this kid, like, once. Sure. But, you know, just the thought of her pops into her head. But, no, like, now that she's, like, listening in on people's conversations, she's thinking, hey, maybe this isn't the worst thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's a double-edged sword. Exactly. Upon coming to the end of Pelco Avenue, Dash finally stands at the entrance to the squat, two-story medical offices building listed as containing Dr. Feichel's practice. The interior of the building has a large fountain in the center with a 40-foot-tall glass replicant of the Cavenda Royal Sigil. Hallways to Dash's left and right lead to different doctor's offices. A nearby set of elevators and a winding spiral staircase lead upwards to the same. A holographic directory reveals that Dr. Feichel's office is located on sub-floor 2 and is listed as biology, genomics, and epidemiology. Epidemiology. So biology, genomics, and epidemiology. Which are, I'll tell you, because Dash would 
Dash would know what that is. You know what biology is. Everybody knows what biology is. Yep. Genomics is the interdisciplinary field of biology focusing on the structure, function, evolution, mapping, and editing of genomes. Okay. And then... And then epidemiology is how diseases spread. Yes. Incidence, distribution, and possible control of diseases. So she has a very unique skill set. The door is opened, and upon entering the waiting room, Dash sees only three other patients, elderly locals all, sitting in a room with enough uncomfortable-looking seats for 20. Quiet, calming music drones from hidden speakers in the ceiling, and a gentle light explores outwards from a large central fish tank in the center of the room. As Dash walks by the tank, the faces of two elderly people sitting on the opposite side of the glass have their faces warped and mutated into horrific visages ever so briefly. From behind the front desk, Vernon, the same assistant that had sent Dash the earlier message, looks up at her and smiles before sliding a pane of glass to the side and saying, Last name and appointment time. I don't have an appointment, but... I was hoping I could speak with Dr. Feigl. And your name? Uh, she's gonna use... Kara's name. Okay. All right, Miss Buoyant Wynn, go ahead and take a seat. I'll let you know when the doctor's ready for you. It's gonna be a bit of a wait. As you can see, she has patience before you. Yeah, completely understandable. I know I'm showing up here unannounced. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And she, he, she, he just kind of like nods. God. <laughs> she kind of turns and like she, she balls her fists real quick, takes a deep breath and then lets him go. Like she just wants to, she wants to reach out and, and, and touch him in the face. Yeah. <laughs> like he's just giving off that air. The wait lasts about an hour and a half no i would say the way lasts about two hours before dash gets in there so she gets in there at about somewhere between 4 30 and 5 p.m and the inside of dr feichel's office is overtly lavish for the <clears throat> from the cavendian plush green carpet to the wall covered in bookcases holding awards accommodations and degrees it's clear to anyone entering this space that dr feichel is a well-educated and intelligent person Dash sees degrees for molecular biology, genealogy, and paleontology, as well as the ones that she saw listed out on the walls. The doctor sits behind her great mahogany desk. She's in her late 40s. Oh, I got a picture. Hold on. Oh, God, she looks evil. The doctor sits behind her great mahogany desk. She's in her late 40s, has thick black hair with a, with a white stripe running down the side. She wears a white medical lab coat and carries a strong air of disinterest upon gazing up to look at Dash when she enters. She does not stand or reach out to shake. Yes, welcome. How can I help you? Uh, Dr. Feigl, um, well, first things first, my name's not really Kara. My name is Veronica Dashing Star. I contacted the office about at a trolling rock and... You know, I just got the most unwelcomed response back. And I didn't want to get pushed out for inquiring earlier. So I gave the man at the desk a false name just so I could talk to you. I'm real interested in the work you're doing here. And as Dash is talking, her eyes are fucking kind of moving around the room like from Dr. Feichel just to get get the lay of the land, like make sure she sees everything. And roll an observation for me. Okay. And as she's doing this, Dr. Feichel says, mm, well, welcome, Miss Dashing Star. I can't say I'm quite pleased with the theatrics. Not quite a good way to start a dialogue. Oh, I completely understand that, Dr. Feichel. And Dash notices that on one of the bookcases running along the left side of the room, there's a rare framed physical photo of a younger Dr. Feigl with a handsome man 
with dark skin, glasses, and a shaved head. The pair is smiling. And for some reason, Dash gets the feeling that she's seen this man's face before, but she struggles to place it. My dear, I understand that you were a medic with the USAR, where files are simply delivered through chain of command, but here in the private sector, such requests by people would need power of attorney for something like this. I can't just give out clients' paperwork to just anyone who walks in off the street. It's unprofessional, which clearly you're comfortable with. You're not even a licensed medical professional. Your temporary military license expired when you left the Medicor. You've got no right to be treating anyone, let alone a frail elderly patient. Your concern on this issue is clear and noted, but you've got no standing here. So, obviously, this bitch knows exactly who you are. So she's done her research. She's going to take read of how Dr. Feigl is acting... And she's going to say, ma'am, I see you've done your research on me. You seem to know exactly who I am. She, she nods and she goes, the rulership of Kavinda does its due diligence. And she's going to... And like, as Dash is taking all this in, just getting hit with fucking baseballs. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> it's... I told you that fucking Robocop meme. Um, it's policy of the Covenant Oversight Bureau that any knowledge of our private studies and practices which could potentially physically endanger a patient or another person being released to the public is illegal. And it's our duty to deny that request. I'm sorry, my hands are tied. There's nothing I can do to help you. These rules are clearly printed and discussed in the paperwork signed by Miss Trollenrock. I understand that there's nothing you can do to help me. However, I am in the process of training to get my medical license. And I was hoping I might be able to offer my services as a research assistant to help you guys out. And she kind of leans forward and like puts her hands on the table and she goes, do you think I'm stupid? I know who you are. I know why you're here. I know that you're working with the Odessan Royals. Why would you be taking a job here? You've already lied once, madam. Are you lying to me now? And she's just like staring at her. She says, no, ma'am. I only lied to just get an audience with you after doing my initial um, scans of, of Miss Ada, it really caught my eye and it got me interested. My, uh, my tour with the Royals is, is coming to an end pretty soon. So my, my time will be much more free. And she kind of like raises an eyebrow and she goes, scan. What did you, what are you talking about? Oh, just a basic physical of Miss Ada. You know, they let me know that that she was sick. She's an old family friend. Um, So I did my best to just give her a physical and and see what was going on. And she's like, a family friend, is that what you call your mother-in-law on this planet? How does she know so much? (laughs) It's it's that... uh... (laughs) It's that fucking Ralph Wiggum meme where he's like, I'm in danger. <laughs> uh, yeah, she's in danger. This is setting off all the... She's like, if you've scanned the old woman, then you know. I assume that's why you requested her documents then. I'm trying to beat around the bush, but... I feel like you're a straightforward kind of woman. And I appreciate that. Yes, I did a scan. I saw what's inside of her. And I'm real interested in what's going on. And tell me, what do you think is going on? 
Well, it obviously looks like you're growing something in her. And I would like to know what that is. And while, yes, it hits home, because she is my mother-in-law, that family friend, good family friend, I would like to see what Kavinda's got in store. From behind Dash, the sudden unexpected sound of a male's voice says, You're quite the tenacious one, Miss Dashing Star. I didn't expect this meeting to come until later during this trip, but... Here you are, then. Might as well get to it, I suppose. As Dash turns to look over her shoulder at this intruder, she sees that Cavendian Ocean Administrator, Delco Muir, leans against the frame of an open secret door that had been hidden within the bookshelf. She recognizes him from the morning's newsfeed. The 43-year-old man leans casually, resting his shoulder against the frame. In one hand, he holds a half-full bourbon, and stares at her slyly the way Dash saw the golden tigers on Ashkabok staring at birds. Even though he's not at the gala, the administrator wears a tailored, sharp-edged, dark green suit with a purple tie and a black collared shirt. Hold on. Shiny silver cufflinks reflect off the harsh halogen lights on the ceiling. Standing behind the administrator, in the darkness of the hidden passageway is an armed and armored royal guard of Kavinda. Stepping out from the secret hallway, Delco moves across the room quickly to take a seat in the empty chair next to Dash. As he does so, the Kavindian soldier follows suit, and the secret passageway closes behind him. Delco takes an, another sip from his drink and casually sets the glass down on Dr. Feichel's table before saying to Dash, May I have the pleasure of introducing myself, Baron Delco Muir. Roll observation. Like Roz, Delco has a robotic hand. His is colored to look like flesh, so it's readily passable if you didn't know what to look for. But Dash does. Uh, she takes on more of a, a soldier stance when he comes in, and she says, It's, it's very nice to meet you, Baron Muir. He says, likewise, my dear, I think you're going to want to hear what I have to say. I've been working on this proposal for a while now. Please don't be rude. Sir, what you got for me? So, suddenly the security guard locks the door to the office. And when she does so, Dr. Feichel presses a concealed button underneath her desk that then closes metal shutters across the windows of the room. And Delco says, You've quite literally walked into the hyena's den, my dear. All for the sake of what, family? Coming here like you have? I must question if you're either very brave or disappointingly stupid. I imagine the remainder of our conversation will inform me of the answer. Tell me, do you know the metaphor of the carrot... And the stick. Can't say I've heard that one. Is that a Kavinda say? No. It's an old earth, I believe, but... Let's just say I hope you choose the carrot. What I have to say to you now will be a difficult conversation. Would you like a glass of water before I begin? Our recently installed water treatment plant has been doing wonders for the flavor of this world's drinking water. Not even a lingering flavor of salt, as if it was poured from the great high mountains of Govinda directly here to a graciously thirsty Delphine. Uh, she doesn't want to be rude, so she'll accept, but she's not actually going to drink it. Okay, and he takes note of that. During your delegation's time on my home world, Agents within the Royal Cavenda Security Bureau learned everything that they could about Commander Torn, Ibiov Starlov, Grant Beauregard, and yourself, as there was no available information on the children whatsoever prior to their adoption. Our focus fell upon you four. 
how exciting it was for us to learn that you're a native to one of the planets we've become so proud to dutifully oversee. It's kismet, I thought to myself. An opportunity for all, if we're blessed with the sight to see it. Tell me, do you have the sight to see it, my dear? I'm following. Good. My grandfather may still bear some sort of ill-advised nostalgic respect for Navoyo Odessa, but the frame of time he ruled within is gone. The man is old and feeble. He can barely dress himself in the morning. I do not sit with the same burdens of disillusionment. I see the Lord of Gold for who he is. A power-hungry monarch. This war that Pavlovich is attempting to incite between the PMAC and the USAW, it's not for some altruistic goal of stopping a terrorist cell from wreaking havoc across the hexagalaxies. No. His intent is nothing more than the total subjugation of the entire Killslayer Quadrant. I have known this man since we were children. One could even... One could have even once called us friends. So mark my words. Odessa is not enough for his ego. He wants this planet back. He wants my planet. He wants them all. That is who you're working for. A despot. A man who would cause untold bloodshed simply because he wants a bigger toy chest. What we are doing here is in defense of that. Are you still with me, Miss Dashing Star? I understand what you're saying, sir. Tapping a button on his personal tech pad, Administrator Muir pulls up a holographic projection of Dash's military record. Now, these are typically sealed, but being planetary royalty has its perks. Besides, the media... <clears throat> Besides, the Metacore is nothing if not a leaking faucet of information. All that emotional trauma, I'd imagine. Anyways, Veronica Artugia Dashing Star, born August 18th, 2350. Married to one Oscar Trolling Wave. Born and raised locally here on Delphine. Entered USAR military service in 2368. Boot camp completed on Kevala. Middle of your class, not so impressive. Served on the frigates Asclepius and Machion before transitioning to the Metacore during your third year. Over the next four years, it appears you spent time working as a field medic and trauma surgeon for battalions during insurrectionist rebellions on Thuturuta, Ibzorian, Zuvali, as well as providing medical delivery and educational teachings to... And he's like, like scrolls through a list of like 60 colonies. Countless USAW stations scattered throughout both the Kill Slayer and the USAW space proper. It's a distinguished record for someone so painfully average. I blame your world for that. However, there's no wonder why you left. I'd have done the same. <clears throat> I'd have done the same, royalty or not. Anyways, what is currently unavailable within your medical... What is currently unavailable within your military record, however, is the reason for your departure. Here, at the bottom, there's a blacked-out paragraph which simply reads at the end that you've been granted an honorable discharge. And that's where it ends. No explanations whatsoever. So, tell me, Miss Dashing Star, what happened on your last mission? I'd love to hear about it. Behind the desk, Dr. Feichel goes, so would I. Mm, she's going to try and keep it vague. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I found out on one of my last missions, I found out uh, we were doing some some things I didn't agree with. And it went bad for us, and I couldn't recover from that. So I felt I had to part ways with the military. 
there there's like a, a palpable moment of silence as sort of both Delco and Dr. Feichel wait for Dash to continue, but then she doesn't, and they kind of like look at each other. And Delco looks back at Dash, and he goes, I told you before, there are perks to being a member of the Kavindian royal family, and while your file may be redacted officially, there are certain ways for people of great means to circumvent such roadblocks. Money and the promise of status can go a very long way to those seeking more, and aren't so many of us. My people were able to confirm that the planetary colony, you and your medical battalion were sent to perform this mission on, is a Usar world known as Medoja. As you know, it's a small desert world with a sole export of some sort of glass. What is it called again, Georgina? Speaking for the first time in minutes, Dr. Feichel says in a cool tone, Frit. Dash realizes now that the entire time she's enraptured in Ducko's speech, this woman has been staring at her, studying her most minute of subconscious facial expressions. Snapping a finger and pointing at Dr. Feichel for recognition, Dash Ducko says, That's it, Frit! It's essentially a finely powdered glass that can withstand an absolutely absurd level of heat. Both the PMAC and USA have corporations utilizing the substance to keep all of our ships from burning up in planetary atmosphere. Very lucrative, I'm told. The thing about Frit, however, is that it's just damn it's just so damn easy to harvest. But the simplest machine can scoop sand, and so for the most part it's a pretty empty world. I believe the listed colonists count before your arrival was Omega one five or one one five. Delco pauses, falling into his own train of thought before saying, Is, <clears throat> Isn't it so odd that such a small, forgettable world could prove so valuable to the Hexa Galaxies? Without waiting for Dash to respond, he continues, What your very m most, what you and your battalion were very most likely unaware of, however, is that the planet most close to Medosia, the salt moon of Asphodel, where your battalion stopped to re-up on its medical supplies and pick up those vaccine doses you so eloquently left out of your story, yes, we know about them, has a very old, 87 years old, in fact, very secretive scientific outpost. Once it belonged to the USA military command. Or once it belonged to USAR Military High Command. But during the Unitism Wars, reports of the facility being destroyed beyond repair left High Command blacklist the site. Or <clears throat> reports of the facility being destroyed beyond repair left High Command to blacklist the site and destroy any evidence of existence. The rabbit hole deepens, I assure you. What the USAR didn't know, however, is that the commander of the military force who declared the facility destroyed beyond repair was Lord Pavlov Anatolievich, father to the current Lord of Gold. For decades, this scientific facility held secret and safe within the salt mines of Asphodel was used by Lord Anatolievich to create weapons of war, all technologically based. Like, so, Edessa is well-known throughout the galaxy as being mostly advanced in regards to their ships and military equipment and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Asphodel, the secret lab on Asphodel is, like, where they did a lot of that stuff. We had reports that it had been closed down upon his death, but that it was, as recently as two years ago, reopened again by his son to conduct studies on a xenobiological subject. Tell me, Miss Dashing Star, have you ever heard the name Victor Manuglevich? No, sir. Not many have. The man was a soldier of the USA like yourself. However, his military career was shrouded in secrecy from nearly the start. Little more than a trained killer, Manuglevich exists for most mainly as a rumor, and even then not by his own name. A ghost story. 
You and your other soldiers would have heard of him as Alibaba, or Araska, or Fenrir. All three names Dash recognizes as, like, ghost stories that soldiers tell each other of essentially, like, the ultimate killer. Mm-hmm. All popular Yusam rumors about the same man, a killer of men. Six years ago, every trace of Manuglavish vanished, only for rumors to resurface two years ago from some of my scouts, let's call them, on Odessa that he was working with retired PMAC, Captain Jonald Grimshaw, and a crew of mercenaries called the Reapers. That Manuglovich himself led, led a direct attack on the Golden Cathedral, and that Lord Pavlovich in some foolishly ill <coughs> and Lord Pavlovich in some foolishly ill-fated coup. It is at this point that Manuglovich was taken into custody by Pavlovich and vanished. This Captain Grimshaw and the rest of his crew managed to escape Odessa custody, I'm told, and have apparently been plaguing Navoyo Odessa ever since. Now finally, to my point. Upon word of the facility of, on Asphodel reopening, I personally did everything I could and spent as much money as I could, no little feat, I assure you, to get someone loyal to the Covenant cause that I trust inside of that facility. We received one report before our spy went dark nearly a year and a half ago, only a month before the attack on Novoyo Odessa. Victor Manuglovich was being held captive within and is himself the aforementioned xenobiological subject. Whatever mutation that affected Captain Grimshaw, that allowed him to create whatever those creatures are, it appears to have also affected other members of the Reapers. How many, I am unsure. Manuglovich was one of them. We believe that whatever this mutation is, Lord Pavlovich is studying it with the intent of creating biological weapons that would leave humanity's current state of military defense unreliable. It is our belief that the events of Smashfall were instigated by Pavlovich himself as a false flag, and that he has every intent to continue utilizing this biological warfare against his enemies. We believe that the vaccine you picked up from the USA military station port on Asphodel was tainted with whatever experiments Pavlovich is doing on this Manuklovich. We believe that the violence you witnessed and faced that day was an experiment at the hands of Odessa. If it failed or succeeded, I do not know. I assume that would have been the prerogative of the project. Standing up from the chair next to Dash, Delco grabs his glass of bourbon, drinks it down, and walks over to his bookshelf to pour himself another glass. I imagine you'd like to have that glass of water now, ma'am. Uh, her face is stone straight, but she does pick up the glass and drinks from it. Quite far from the shallows now, aren't you, dear? Turning to look at Dr. Fico, Delco nods to her and says, You've got my permission to break code protocol, Doctor. Please inform Miss Dashing Star of the details to Project Athanasia. After she taps a few buttons on the table... Dr. Feichel pulls up another font of images, videos, diagrams, studies, and graphs that appear above her desk. Amongst these things, Dash sees video of archaeological digs. The Covindan Quietus Worm, left unknown to history until only four years ago. After draining the Raltusi Reservoir, Delco interrupts, surveys of the lake were done to locate precious metals, which we did. Quite a bit, actually. Patiently, Dr. Feichel sits staring at the administrator until he says, What? And Feichel goes, Are you done? Putting up a hand to gesture his nonverbal go-ahead for the doctor to continue, Georgina says, Once the lake had been dried, digging began. It was here that a great underground cavern was located, 
filled with untold prehistoric life captured as fossils. Covindian archaeologists were, as you can imagine, overwhelmed with excitement. After my so untimely and public departure from the PMAC scientific sphere years ago, I accepted, <coughs> I accepted a job there to study new findings. Imagine my surprise to learn that the fossils of this particular creature weren't fossils at all, but instead the natural ability to dehydrate oneself and exist for millennia, simply waiting to be reborn within your own cells, like some form of immortality. Imagine what could be done with a power like that on a world with nearly infinite water. Studies started small. Simple dissection did nothing. The quietus continued living, burning it, dipping it in acid, blunt force, nothing mattered. The creature would simply reform upon being submerged in any kind of liquid. From there, animal trials began. Mice were injected first, and to our absolute amazement, the quietus not only thrived within the state of a bloodstream, but grew and evolved. What was once a trait exhibited simply by the worm was something that could be passed on to its host during an extensive time of symbiotic bonding. Before moving on to more advanced trials, myself and the other scientists were able to create a quite vicious cocktail capable of eradicating the quietus from its host entirely. I'll keep those proprietary stages to myself, though. Cats, dogs, monkeys, mules, and more have been tested. The worm, and any organic being, directs itself to the creature's heart before beginning to consume white blood cells in a process that expands itself out as a call across the innards of the host, duplicating itself in a state of parth parthen parthenogenesis. Filtered throughout the body, the host is able to withstand extreme levels of violence. Once that step was behind us, I was given the go-ahead by Baron Muir to proceed with human trials. <clears throat> Holographic images above the desk changed from visuals of Kavinda to visuals of Dauphine. The building of a great underwater facility underneath of a kelp harvester the training of locals on mecha gatherers. Inside of the facility where locals lock their mechs into stasis docking bays and take shuttles back up to the surface. Secretive underground areas of the facility filled with scientists in lab coats with sleeping elderly people in pods all being studied. Blood samples being taken, mouths being swabbed, eyes being checked. And Delco says, but why study at home? I thought. Covinda has water, sure. There are plenty of seas and underground wells, but Dauphine, well, their culture could surely benefit from such a beneficial scientific study. Do you see now, Veronica? While Navoyo Odessa builds biological weapons to build this galaxy to its knees, Covinda is building it a shield. Something to protect everyone. We have already made millions of lives better with technological prosthesis. Imagine a future where machinery is redundant. Imagine a future where humanity could simply regrow lost limbs. Imagine how far we could go without the restraints of pain or death. This is the study that your husband's grandmother takes part in. She is a pioneer. She is a hero. Progress is painful, my dear. And paradise is nothing if not built on the back of pain. Dr. Feichel speaks up. After your arrival on Kavinda, at a trolling rock was specifically targeted and selected for this cure as a political move by the Baron to shore up his discussion. Imagine my surprise to find that the woman was already actively dying of heart disease. Convincing her local doctor to refer her to me was too easy. The man barely asked for any payment at all. I guess living on the fringes for decades, eking by a survival living, eking by a survival living, had grown tiring. Without me, 
without this study, without the quietus, your precious Atta would have died weeks ago before you'd ever even arrived here. Every single moment you've spent with her upon your return, every breath she's taken, every word she's spoken, has been because of me. Uh, Dash needs to sit down. <laughs> Just shotgun blast. <laughs> yeah. She's she's obvious. Like, she can recognize that she's in a spot where she probably shouldn't say too much. Just because she's definitely, like, out of her league with with what's going on. You know, here she is, a small-time player, like... The little leaguer in yeah, she's waiting the MLB. For the second shoe to drop. Yeah, she's very conflicted because. Yeah, walk through it because I just dropped a lot of shit on you. Yeah, so she was already feeling some kind of way about you saw. Yeah, and and everything that they were doing. Uh, that Vasily. O- that Vasily and Odessa. Okay. So she's she's definitely feeling like they are the bad guys right now and that she was totally right to go ahead and uncouple herself with the army. Like there's a little bit also of why did I accept this mission? I should have just stayed on Odessa minding my own business. Like obviously she didn't know like, something like this was going to happen. But, you know, you get into that spot and you're just like, man, I just, I should not have done this. I should have stayed out of this. Yeah, that single decision could have essentially destroyed her entire life. Yeah. And then just like hearing about how the quietest firms, about how they're they're helping. Because, okay, I guess it's a symbiotic parasite. And also, like, I mean, she's still not 100% convinced that it actually is helping, yeah. obviously, because she she does have a certain level of mistrust while while Muir is, is very charismatic. Feifel is creepy as fuck. Yes, yeah, she is. While she trusts the things that are coming out of Muir's mouth and his speculations, and it's kind of like confirming the same things that have been going on in the back of her head, especially with with the vaccines and that, you know, there was something nefarious behind that, you know, the, the military was obviously using that as some kind of experiment. So like, because she already had those leanings and he kind of solidified that she's definitely swayed more towards him. Okay. And as like, this is all thought processing happening that like over the, like five seconds, basically like, He's got his bourbon. He takes his seat back down on the seat directly across from Dash again. So just so I think we're on the same page, but just so we're on the same page, like Feichel's on one side of the desk and Delco and Dash are on the other side of the desk sitting in chairs and they're like kind of facing each other. Now, you know everything that we know. You know what we are doing here and you know why we're doing it. Clearly... I took a big risk telling you all of this, but something tells me you're a smarter woman than this planet's educational system typically creates. I know you're sitting there now wondering why I've told you all this. I can see it in your eyes. It's very simple. This war cannot happen. If it does, we will face it accordingly, but... I believe that in you, I see a chance to avoid all of this trouble entirely. The Red Angel of Odessa. It's quite a label. You've been accepted into the royal family of Odessa in a way that very few are. To be trusted with the well-being of his children after the so untimely demise of his true daughter. Yes, the position you hold is rare. Even invaluable, some might say. If one in your position was able to get close enough to him, 
they could, by all accounts, end the Lord of Gold's inevitable war before it even begins. Think of it as cutting out a potential cancerous growth before it becomes malignant. Now, the ultimate question here is simple. Are you capable of such a heroic act and the emotional weight that comes with it? Or have I wasted hundreds of man-hours and millions of dollars to put you in this chair? Sir, are you asking me to kill him? I am. You are a soldier, after all. What do soldiers do if not fight for the greater good? Sir, I'm a soldier, but I'm a I'm a medic. The only person I've killed was back on Asphodel, and that was out of self defense. I'm no assassin. And he kinda nods. He takes a drink. Such a pity. The stick then. I truly believed you were the one. That oaf of a commander is obviously a lost cause, but with your background, what Odessa put you through with those children, such a shame. All right. Too morally upright for this. Moving on then. Delco looks over at Dr. Feichel, nods, and says, Trigger enzyme B. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. Without responding. <laughs> Feichel simply presses a few buttons on her computer and leans back in her chair, silently staring at Dash. What 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 are you guys triggering right now? Let's just wait and see what happens, shall we? No, I mean, is, is there something else that I can I can do for you guys? I don't think I can bring myself to 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 kill, but I mean, there's there's got to be something. I feel like you're. You're, you're about to take Ada away from me. Suddenly, Dash's sliver starts to vibrate, beep, and light up, informing her of an incoming short-range calm. Georgina speaks up, saying, You should probably answer that. She, ans- she answers it. <laughs> Vivian's holographic face appears before Dash, hovering above the woman's, ro- hovering above the woman's wrist. Dash's mother is clearly panicked and says, Veronica, what did you do? What medicine did you give her? She's sick. She She's bleeding out of her nose and her eyes. What did you do? And like you can hear Ada just like screaming in pain in the background. What's happening? What do I do? Oh, God. Dash is panicking. And before Vivian can finish, Delco reaches out and taps Dash's sliver, ending the call prematurely. And Georgina just shakes her head. She goes, you know, as a medic, you really should have known better than to change a patient's medicine before speaking with the prescribing doctor. If she dies now, it's on you. Oh God! Oh God! Uh, tears are running down Dash's face as we, as the ahead. panic is <laughs> setting in. We're the only ones with the medicine that can save her, and if you want that to happen, you're going to calm down, take a seat, and listen to what Delco has to say. She like she she rubs the 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 tears off of her cheeks and. She says, what? So. What do I need to do? You work for us now. Going forward, you will find a way to kill the king. Agree to this, and Atta will be helped and monitored safely to make sure the remainder of her symbiotic growth expansion continues positively. She sniffs and she she agrees. She says, I'll find a way. Just don't let her die. So Delco goes, wonderful. Dr. Feichel, enzyme B, please. At that, Georgina taps on her desk before smiling at Dash. There, all better now. And Delco goes, go ahead and call her back. And she, she brings up her mom. And as soon as her mom answers, she goes, Ada, Ada, is she okay? And Vivian goes, she, she, she's all right. And the, the, the season stopped, and, she, she, and she's stable, I think. Her, her breathing is 
My God, Veronica, she needs help. Something isn't right. So, what's going on? Where are you? you? You have to come home. We need you here. Keep her steady, Ma. I'll be, I'll be home in a bit. At this, Delco silently mouths for Dash to end the call. Then she hangs up. Georgina says, wonderful. Now that that's done, I'll be sending out a group of assistants to bring her to us where she can be overlooked safely. Just to double check, you know. You've got a lot to catch up on. Might as well start with a familiar patient. Standing up from the chair next to her, Delka reaches out a hand to help Dash stand and says, Welcome to Kavinda Rule, Veronica Dashing Star. We've been waiting for you. And like in the back of Dash's mind, she hears her mother's voice say, You're always looking in the wrong directions, Veronica. And we'll end there tonight. No. <laughs> Oh my god, that was awful. <laughs> you mean awesome? <laughs> yes, also awful. Oh man. No, like that when was... when we did the call with that uh Oh, Drew, you got real tears out of me. <laughs>